Hello and welcome to this screencast, which is about the, the classical Americas. We're specifically focused on the Maya culture, which existed in Mexico, and the Mochica culture, which existed in modern day Peru. So let's get started with the key words for part three. The first thing I want to talk about is slash and burn. Slash and burn takes an area of forest, um, cuts it down, clears it, burns the brush, then it grows there for one season. So the benefits of slash and burn, uh, which is also some kind, sometimes called Sweden agriculture, is that it's very productive for the years that it's in use. The next thing I want to talk about is uh, regional variation, and this is especially important with the, the Maya. And a lot of times, the people that we're studying, we sometimes talk about them as just one group where they're all the same. But with the Maya, you're dealing with what is pretty clearly a, a group of city-states that are not ruled by one leader. And there's some differences in culture, so that these three examples of Mayan pyramids are all clearly pyramids and they share some features like the, these steps, they have rows of steps. But at the same time, they vary in certain features from place to place and that's what regional variation is. It's... And finally, I want to talk about verticality, which will be really essentially when we talk about the Mochica. And that's the idea that, especially in the Andes, you have a very quick difference from uh, the lowlands, which are connected to the ocean and allow for fishing and as you move up to the highlands and so you can see here at the very lowest level you can grow corn and bananas as you move up you can grow various crops until at the top it's pretty much just llamas but this allows the Mochica people and and other Andean peoples including the Inca to develop really complicated and integrated agricultural systems where you can trade back and forth from higher levels through lower levels and means that you have in a small area a lot of different foods being cultivated uh, and it can be very efficient and very um, resistant to ecological problems because if you know your llamas for instance don't produce what you wanted to that year you may be able to supplement with something else okay let's go on to the Maya um, I first want to just give you a clear geographical idea of where the Maya are this is called the Yucatan Peninsula and that's really the Maya heartland. I also want to give you a little bit of a timeline orientation, I'm specifically talking about this, the classical period, about 300 to 900. But some important aspects of um, Mayan culture had, had developed much earlier than that, and that's important to recognize. I'm going to focus on two things. The first is Maya politics, which Stearns doesn't cover in detail. Um, especially I want to talk about the military of the Maya. There had been some time ago kind of a idealization of the Maya as a peaceful people who only had economic connections and no military connections and that's been pretty clearly proved false in recent years uh, in about the last 20 or so years. We know that the Maya did engage in military uh, attacks, sometimes occupations, that they used fairly sophisticated obsidian weapons. These are made from obsidian which is a kind of volcanic stone which can be sharpened quite uh, significantly and that they sometimes took prisoners, this is a cutting of a prisoner, who they then used for human sacrifice. And so that's a different view of the Maya than maybe is was classically believed. Um, all of this is mostly based on archaeological evidence, especially on the existence of these spears that seem to be broken in a, a centralized area, and that suggests some kind of battle. I also want to talk a little about the economics and the trade and the taxes and the production. Um, Mayan economic production was very well developed. So you had a lot of manufactured goods. You uh, also had production of luxury goods like cocoa. That's what this is up here. This is again the obsidian that we saw in the previous one. Uh, these are very highly processed luxury goods. And the Maya are also um, known for their, their pottery. This is probably a ritual uh, pot, but there were probably similar pots that were created more for daily use. And they had a system of taxation which is not dissimilar from what you might have seen in Egypt or Sumer where farmers had to pay a certain amount of their production to the state and the state was able to use that for whatever they wanted. You also see in the Maya the existence of a labor tax where peasants had to devote part of their labor to building the great monuments like this one at Chichen Itza. Um, Farmers had to devote some of their time to building that. And again, that's quite similar with what we see in uh, Egypt and Sumer, Sumer. 
All right, I'm going to move on to the Mochica State. Uh, quite distant um, geographically, the Maya in modern Mexico, the Mochica in modern Peru. And you can see here that they that the influence of the Mochica, that we've seen Mochica style agricultural sites in a long distance up and down the coast. But also notice that they don't go too far inland. And the reason that is, I'm sure you can guess, because there are the huge Andes Mountains here. And that's what we talked about before with verticality. The Mochica had to deal with a huge increase in elevation very quickly from the coast. And they actually moved that to their advantage, as we discussed before, using a lot of resources from the ocean, a lot of fishing, and also tried to farm at the different levels as the mountains moved up and farming different crops at those different levels. When we talk about the Mochica, we, we can see the beginnings around 150 CE. We're not exactly sure what caused those beginnings, but we see a big archaeological change and the development of the earliest sites are around then. And then by about 750 CE, the, that system collapsed. And it seems pretty clear that the collapse is due to environmental changes. Um, it seems like there are a series of years where there is a, a drought, a lack of rain, and that essentially causes the collapse of that system. And the beginning of a new system, the, the Chavin, succeed the, the Mochica uh, in the same area. I'm going to cover uh, social, politics, culture, and economics here very briefly. One of the things that the Stearns doesn't cover, po probably because um, the work that's being done on this is still new, is the Mochica gender relations. And recently, there have been a couple really important finds. This is a, a mummified Mochica body, and it's of a, of a woman. And there have been a couple finds of uh, Mochica women who have been buried in a way to suggest that they are not only elites, but possibly religious leaders, possibly even political leaders. And that suggests that some women, at least, were able to find very high levels of influence in Mochica culture. We don't have any written records, so we don't know the details, but archaeolo some archaeologists go as far as to say that at least parts of the Mochica um, state may have been uh, ruled by women. And um, But again, we don't know that much. We don't know the details. And we've also found very richly decorated and richly buried men as well. I'm not just going to talk about, I'm going to try to get politics, culture, and economics in here. Um, here is another, I'm going to try to get politics, culture, and a little bit of economics in here. Once again, uh, the Maya have a written language that we can read, but the Mochica, we, we don't have any written documents from them. So everything that we know is based on archaeological evidence. So things are a little bit less specific. But here we have a, another outline of a, a burial. In this case, it's a, of a warrior male and uh, some of his retainers and some of his objects. And so that shows that not all of the leaders were women, although, like we said, some of them may have been. Um, and what we know from the, from both all of those burials is that there is a pretty clear elite class in the Mochica who probably held most of the power and controlled most of the population. Uh, that's also tied to cultural factors. There's very lots of religious imagery. In this case, this um, face in here, which is depicted sometimes with spider legs, is called in English the decapitator, or the person who cuts off heads. And like the Maya, the Mochica also practiced ritual human sacrifice. And that religion and that sacrifice may have been part of political control, although archaeologists, again, are not sure about that. One of the other interesting things about the Mochica is that uh, they, it seems that they may have expanded their power militarily, which suggests that power was not only held by priests, but also by military leaders. Again, that's something that might be similar to Sumer, where there are both priests who have a certain amount of local power and military leaders who are often the kings. Perhaps Mochiga was similar, but we don't know. Finally, economic-wise, it doesn't seem that Mochica had a bureaucratic system or another system of keeping records that was robust enough to, to gather tax the way we think about it now. We don't see necessarily that farmers would have paid a certain amount of their produce, but it may have been something that's more similar to what we would think of as a chiefdom system where um, individual members would give gifts to the chief and the chief would then redistribute that surplus to the population in feast time. 
that seems possible. But once again, we're not sure because of a lack of evidence. And that, that might be one of the reasons that Stearns doesn't cover it. Thank you very much for watching. Good luck working with the text this week. Uh, as always, if you cannot figure out one of the sections, just leave it blank and come to class and ask me about it. And I'll see you then. Thanks very much.